Hey guys, I hope you're having a great day. Today we're going to be talking about RNA, another nucleic acid, and the building of a protein or protein synthesis. You should be filling in your notes organizer as I go through this video. So the central dogma of this biology of biology is this really big idea related to the life sciences. And that big idea is that one gene codes for one protein. And a gene is just a segment of DNA. So one gene codes for one protein. In other words, DNA is read by RNA, meaning its message is sort of used and copied by RNA, which then travels to the ribosomes to make proteins. You already know this. You know that DNA carries this genetic code, these instructions, and you know that ribosomes make proteins. So somehow we have to get that message from the DNA in the nucleus to the ribosome where proteins are actually made. Okay, so this big idea, this central dogma of biology, is where you start with DNA, you use it to make RNA, that message is read to make proteins. That's this big idea in biology. Okay, so what is our RNA? Let's start by talking about that. RNA is ribonucleic acid. It's still a nucleic acid. Its monomer is still nucleotides. But there are some major differences between DNA and RNA. So obviously, there's DNA and there's RNA. So that letter must mean there's a difference. So the sugar in RNA is ribose. The sugar in DNA is, of course, deoxyribose. They're both five carbon sugars. The ribose in DNA is just without an oxygen. It's deoxified. Okay, so there's one difference. Another difference is that instead of the nitrogen base thymine like you have in DNA, RNA has the base uracil. Okay, so still pairs with adenine. Thymine just doesn't exist in RNA. You have the, the nitrogen base uracil. Now, a huge difference between RNA and DNA is that RNA is single-stranded, while DNA is, of course, double-stranded, the double helix, which allows, this last difference, for RNA to be able to leave the nucleus. So because it's single-stranded, it, it physically is smaller, and it can actually fit through the nuclear pores of the nuclear membrane. Okay, so that's number two on your notes organizer. There are three types of RNA. There is mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA. mRNA stands for messenger RNA, and as the name suggests, this carries the message from the DNA in the nucleus to the ribosomes where the proteins are going to be made. Ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, is literally just part of what makes up a ribosome. A ribosome is made up of a jumbled up proteins and rRNA. And then um, transfer RNA, tRNA, transfers amino acids to the ribosomes. And if you remember when we talked about biochemistry, amino acids are the monomers of proteins. So you put amino acids together to form proteins. Okay, so that's mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA are three types of RNA molecules. Okay, a lot of the words in this unit sort of sound similar. We talked about replication, which was using DNA to make more DNA. Now we're going to talk about transcription, which is using that message of DNA in the nucleus of a cell and copying it onto an, an RNA molecule so that it can leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome to make a protein. So big picture transcription is going from DNA to messenger RNA. So what is transcription? It's the making of RNA from DNA, which is, of course, happening in the nucleus. Anytime you're dealing with DNA, it's going to be in the nucleus because it can't leave. And basically, you have an enzyme called RNA polymerase. Hmm, that sounds similar. That sounds a lot like DNA polymerase, where you are building a molecule of DNA. So what do you think RNA polymerase does? RNA polymerase makes a molecule of RNA. So it binds to the DNA and be begins building a complementary strand of mRNA. Very similar to what we were doing in DNA replication when the helicase had split it apart. But now A is going to pair with U because instead of thymine, we have uracil. So if we have an exposed adenine, we're going to pair in a uracil onto that, but then the rest remains the same. If you have an exposed thymine, you're going to pair an adenine. If you have an exposed cytosine, a guanine, and then a guanine, a cytosine. So why? Why do we have to have this process? We have to have this process because DNA can't leave the nucleus, but mRNA can. So we call it messenger RNA because it literally carries the message from the nucleus to the ribosome. So why do we have this process? Because 
mRNA can leave the nucleus. Okay, so here's transcription happening. We still had helicase come along and unzip our molecule of DNA, but now we have the enzyme RNA polymerase, this big old blobby protein here, that's attaching to the DNA and building a molecule of RNA. So you can see here, this molecule is single-stranded, which means it's going to be able to be small enough to fit through these nuclear pores here. Okay, so number eight, Let's do that together before I go on to this slide. It says, following transcription, what would be the complementary mRNA sequence to this strand of DNA? So if our first set of bases are A, G, C on our DNA molecule, what would be our complementary sequences on an RNA molecule? You would have U, C, G. And let's do the next set. If we had T, C, C on our DNA molecule, what would be on our RNA molecule? A, G, G. Okay, now you keep going and see if you can do the rest. DNA, this is what happens in real life. DNA and RNA are read, quote unquote, three bases at a time. That set of three bases is called a codon. So it's a three base sequence that signals for a specific amino acid. There are 64 possible codons or three letter combinations. Now remember, proteins are made up of amino acids. Those are the monomers of our protein polymer. There are 20 different types of amino acids, but there are 64 possible codons. So there are several codons that code for the same amino acid. Okay, so there's our sequence of DNA. Let's see if you did it correctly and got your sequence of mRNA. A is paired with U's, G is paired with C's, C is paired with G's, T's, they still pair with A's, you still have adenines, but everywhere you have an adenine, now you're going to have a uracil. That's what pairs together. Okay, so see if you can do this next one. Did you get that correctly? Good job. <clears throat> okay, so if this is our RNA sequence, we're going to separate that into codons, which are three base sequences. So our first codon would be UCG, our next codon would be AGG, so on and so forth. Each of those signals for a specific type of amino acids. And these are literally the amino acids that those signal for, serine, arginine, and leucine. And there are little different types of charts that you can use to figure out what amino acids code for, or what codons code for which amino acids. Here's one. You start in the middle and work your way out. So let's go back here. Our first codon was UCG. So starting in the middle, U, C, work your way out, G. That codes for serine. Let's go back and do the next one. A, G, G, A, G, G, arginine, so on and so forth. So you can figure out what any um, codon signals for, which amino acid they signal for using a chart like this. Okay, that brings us to translation. So transcription was using DNA to make a molecule of, of mRNA, RNA. So this is where we pick up for translation. So we have that molecule of mRNA, and now it's going to be used to make proteins. So big picture, mRNA to proteins. So translation is the making of proteins using the instructions from the mRNA message, or translating the code, if you will. This, of course, occurs at the ribosomes. You know this. Ribosomes start with the word rib. Ribs are full of nice, delicious proteins. So ribosomes make proteins. That was our little way to remember that. Okay, so here's translation. Following transcription, mRNA leaves the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm. This is all number 13 on your um, notes organizer. And this is taking place sort of in the cytoplasm and then eventually at the ribosome. Okay, so following transcription, RNA leaves the nucleus through the nuclear pores, enters the cytoplasm, and attaches to the ribosome. Now, here's where things get complicated. That molecule of mRNA, remember, is red, three bases at a time. Those three bases, that codon, signals for an amino acid. Well, something has to bring the correct amino acid. That is transfer RNA. So transfer RNA brings in the proper amino acid that was being signaled by the codon on the mRNA molecule. And that is because tRNA has what's called the anti-codon. Like I said, this is, it gets complicated, but once you have your aha moment, you'll understand. Okay, so tRNA has the anti-codon, which is basically the sequence of bases which complement the mRNA codon. And we'll get more into that in a minute. 
But the tRNA molecules bring in the amino acids one by one to the ribosome, and those amino acids join together with peptide bonds. Okay, so the next amino acid is brought in by the next tRNA molecule, joins together, forms a peptide bond. So on and so on until you reach what's called a stop codon. Once the ribosome reads a stop codon, that means the protein has been built, also known as a polypeptide chain. That makes sense, many peptides, that's what's holding together the amino acids. So once you reach a stop codon, the protein has been built and then is released back into the cell. Okay, so all of that is number 13 on your notes organizer. Okay, so here is a little joke that you can bring in for a bonus on Wednesday. Um, what are proteins made up of? Student says, mean old acids. Why is this joke absolutely hilarious? Write that down on a sheet of paper, bring it in, and I'll give you a bonus point on your homework check. Okay, so back to translation. Here is what it looks like. We have our mRNA molecule, which is being read three bases at a time. That's called a codon at the ribosome. So AUG, that signals for methionine, which all uh, proteins start with methionine. So that signals for this. And how do we know that that amino acid is going to be brought? Because it is being carried by the transfer RNA molecule that has the complementary anticodon, so UAC. Okay, our next codon on our mRNA molecule was UUC. That signals for this amino acid right here, which is brought by our tRNA molecule with AAG. So you can see this process continue here. Those are going to join together by peptide bonds until eventually they reach a stop codon and the protein is released into the cell. Okay, going back to that picture, use that to label the parts for number 15 on your notes organizer. Okay, what if something goes wrong? We've used this term a lot in class, mutations. Let's talk about what that actually means. A mutation is simply a change in the DNA sequence that affects genetic information. So any change in a DNA sequence is called a mutation. Now, there are two different types of mutations. You can have gene mutations and you can have chromosomal mutations. So gene mutations are a result from a change in one single gene. Like for example, one letter is changed in a gene. That's a gene mutation. A chromosomal mutation would be like Down syndrome where you have some, some sort of error that has occurred with an entire chromosome. Maybe there's one too many, maybe there's one too few. Those would be examples of chromosomal mutations. Now, this was an essay question on your test um, several weeks ago. Body cell versus sex cells mutations. I told you that an error in mitosis couldn't be passed down, but that an error in meiosis could be, and then I asked you why that was true. The simple answer is that mitosis happens in somatic cells. You don't pass your somatic cells to your offspring. The only cell you give directly to your offspring are going to be egg or sperm, right? Those are produced from meiosis. So somatic cell mutations are not passed on to the next generation. Mutations that occur in sex cells, however, are passed on to the organism's offspring if that egg or sperm happens to be fertilized. That cell will then go through mitosis so that that mutation is in every cell of the offspring. Okay, there are things called point mutations and frame shift mutations. Point mutations are easy because it's just a mutation that occurs at one nitrogen base. So A is substituted for G. Some error that occurs where a single nucleotide is substituted for another one. That's called substitution. Okay, um, some of those point mutations can actually cause what's called frame shift mutations, where the entire reading frame is shifted in one direction or another. An insertion or a deletion can cause a frame shift mutation. An insertion is where you literally have a nitrogen base that is inserted where it's not supposed to be. And then a deletion, of course, is where you have a nitrogen base that is removed when it's not supposed to be removed. Okay, these types of mutations shift the reading frame of the genetic message. Let me go back here. So see if you can figure out number 22 on your notes organizer. Show me a substitution, an insertion, and a deletion using this page right here as sort of like a guide. Okay, leave the last section of your notes organizer for class, and I will see you tomorrow. Have a great day.